Please be seated. <clears throat> well, as I said at the beginning of the service, this weekend we celebrate the sanctity of human life. We actually celebrate life every time we gather to worship, but especially this day. We like to make a special point to talk about life today because June 24th is when the Supreme Court made a huge decision to overturn the ruling from January of 73 that allowed Americans to legally end the life of their babies. Now the decision making for life goes back to the states. Now states are free to ensure that the most vulnerable American citizens have the protection they deserve. And currently, currently state pro-life laws have saved 210,000 unborn lives every year. Isn't that amazing? 210,000 people. How many of you have been praying for the cure for cancer? Okay, one of those saved lives could be the person who finally brings us that cure. Isn't that amazing? But there's still much work to, done, to be done in each state to stand for life. Now, this is a sensitive topic, and there may be people who have a different perspective on life and death. And I want you to be sensitive to the fact that please respectfully hear what I have to say. And if you have another position or an opposing point of view, talk to me afterwards. Because what we have in common in Christ is probably much greater than any differences we might have on any of these issues. Let's begin with prayer. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to stand for life, to speak for those who can't speak for themselves, to be the church in a world that is so engrossed in death. And I pray that you would anoint your truth this morning. Stir us. Stir us to truth, stir us to action, stir us to be extra grateful for the life that you've given us and to stand for the life of others. We pray in your name. Amen. All right, I'm going to begin with some questions. Do you know who the first person to recognize Jesus was? It was an unborn child. Go read about it in the beginning of Luke's gospel. John the Baptist. He was six months in the womb of Mary's cousin Elizabeth, and he leapt in the womb when he came to see the mother of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? All right, here's another one. Do you know how old you are? I'm still waiting for somebody to pull out their driver's license and check. But you know what? In our culture, we measure our age by what? By the date we come out of the womb. But how old are we when we come out of the womb? 49 months. So if you said your date based on your driver's license, you undercounted by nine months. If we really believe that life begins at conception, that we are a human being like those pictures you saw in that opening video, then we're nine months older. Now, I've never known some young person to say, oh, I'm, I'm 15 years and three months. I'm really 16. Can I drive now? <laughs> or I'm 20 years and three months. Oh, but I'm really 21. Can I have that uh, whatever <laughs> you can do at 21? I went to the Social Security Department. I, I, I was thinking, gosh, I'm 64 in three months. Can I have my Medicare now? The world doesn't agree with that, but we're not the world, right? From a biblical point of view, we're all nine months older than we have on our driver's license. Okay, here's the last question. Do you know where the safest place on earth is? The safest place on earth should be the womb of a mother. I recently read a letter of a soon-to-be mom. She was six months pregnant. She spent a lot of time thinking about her baby. That makes sense, right? Is he okay? What will he look like? What will his personality be? You know, how can a baby kick in such an adorable way? <laughs> but one thought kept coming up in her mind. My baby is safe now. Isn't that an odd thought? I thought it was an odd thought. Isn't a mother's womb the safest place for a baby? Isn't the womb the perfect place for your baby to be, to be nourished, protected, grow? Not always. Not in Pennsylvania. In our state, a woman can kill her baby for any reason up to six months of pregnancy. 23 weeks and six days to be exact. For 23 weeks and six days, the baby is not safe in a mother's womb. This law must change. 
we must fight to change it because life is worth fighting for. Over one million abortions still happen in America each year. I keep thinking of those and thinking one of those aborted babies was God's answer to our prayer for a cure to cancer or a cure to Parkinson's or a, a world leader to bring peace. One million abortions, 34,000 of them are in Pennsylvania. The United States is only one of eight countries in the world that allows abortions up to six months of pregnancy. You know what a baby's like at six months? Well, this mother-to-be that wrote this letter, at five months, shared this, at five months, my baby was moving around and kicking. His heart had already beat 20 million times. My baby circulates 55 quarts of blood every day. He has been listening to my voice for weeks and weeks before he reached six months. All these things are true. But this mother still could have legally ended the life of her child if she wanted to. That fact should make us sick to our stomachs. This law must change. We must fight to change it because life is worth fighting for. This life is worth fighting for. Do you know this life right here? This is our music minister Stephanie's grandchild. This is an actual sonogram. You're going to meet her soon. What, two weeks, right? In two weeks. Her daughter, Jess, is going to give, well, sometime in the next two weeks. We don't know. But this, we don't know if it's a boy or a girl. Does it look like a boy or a girl? It's hard to tell. You have to tell her, is it left, left sucking thumb or right sucking thumb? But this is a person that we're going to meet. This is a real person. This life is worth fighting for, all life. This is the 28th year that I've been a part of Prince of Peace Church celebrating life, standing up for life in the womb especially. And I've said many things in those 28 years. I've said that life is sacred because God made it. In Genesis, it says that God made you and I in his image. Not the giraffe, not the hippopotamus, <laughs> not the dog. He made us human beings in his own image. Humans reflect the image and glory of God. It's beautiful. I've said that life <clears throat> is sacred no matter what the condition. All life is valuable. No matter how helpless that person at the end of life, at the beginning of life, God has a purpose for each one of us. Do you know his purpose for you? I've said that life is, life is sacred because of its eternal nature. Each one of us is immortal. Do you realize that? We're going to live forever, ever, either with God or without God. God loves us so much that he wants every human being to live with him forever. The Bible is always, always calling us to choose life. I've said that God starts to develop a child at conception. Psalm 139, God has knitted us together in our mother's womb. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Even babies are not physically perfect. Even th those that aren't physically perfect, God says every one of them in the womb belongs to him. Psalm 127 and verse 3, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. And I've said that, that God begins life, and what God begins, we do not have the freedom to end. So God isn't just concerned with when life begins, he's also concerned with when life ends. And there's a lot of things going on in our culture that says, well, when a person gets to a, they're not useful anymore, or they're in too much pain, we're just going to snuff them out. No. The end of our life is in God's hands as well. I've summed it up like this. At conception, God made it possible for life to start. At the cradle, God made it possible for life to be seen. And at the cross, God made it possible for life to be saved. But here's where I have to say some hard things, because life is under attack in our world today. It is under a vicious attack. The news is full of stories about life, both good and bad. The good news is this week, the prime minister of Italy stood up for life against the United States and against other powerful world leaders at the G7 summit and got language removed from their declaration that was really pushing abortion. The House of Representatives in this country is taking steps to include pro-life amendments in upcoming legislation. And thanks to a new heartbeat law in South Carolina, abortions have dropped in that state by 80%. 
Again, one of those from South Carolina might find out if the person who does discover the cure from cancer is from South Carolina. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of hope in that. Other states are passing new pro-life laws as well. But there's sad news. Our taxpayer dollars are still funding Planned Parenthood. 700 million of our tax dollars every year are paid for the killing of 400,000 babies, eight times more than all the gun-related deaths each year in the U.S. There's chemical abortion pills that account for 63% of all abortions. Anyone can order them by mail to kill their unborn child. The National Rifle Association kills zero people and receives zero government funds. Planned Parenthood kills 400,000 babies every year and receives 700 million in tax dollars. What's wrong with this picture? Does that shock you? Anyway, I get worked up about this. Because, I mean, where's the church in all of this? I mean, if, that, if there's that many Christians who call themselves Christians in this country, this shouldn't be happening. Now, if we don't talk about this in the house of the Lord, we're going to be silent. I guarantee you, if you go out to lunch today after church, the, the waiter or waitress is not going to come up to you and say, well, what do you think about abortion in the country? You know, um, there, this is not being talked about anywhere. It's almost like it's just normal. It's not normal. God's heart is broken when life is taken. Jesus wept when Lazarus died, but God wept when Jesus died on the cross. And yet he knew it was for a greater purpose. But he made us in his image. And every time a life is taken, God weeps. Our laws are backward in this country to allow the legal slaughter of Americans. For comparison, let me ask you, do you know how many Americans have died in all of the wars since George Washington, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, what's the other one, Spanish-American, oh gosh, here's my history teacher's going to say, how come he didn't pay attention? World War I, World War II, Korean War, Vietnam, how many all total? 1.3 million. That's a lot. It breaks God's heart. But in just the last 51 years, 63 million Americans have legally died through abortion. And in those same 51 years, only about 800,000 have died through illegal gun-related crime. Now, I'm not saying anything about guns. I'm just saying that for comparison because what you're going to see in the news is disproportionately reported. Normally, when you talk about, okay, heart disease and chronic this and diabetes and talk about the cause of death, abortion is never listed, but it should be. All deaths break God's heart, but let's make all death illegal, not legal. Okay, our laws must change. We must fight to change them because life is worth fighting for. So how can we fight? Let me just give you some suggestions. First of all, be informed. You know, most people aren't informed. That's why God led me to talk about this today. This may be the only time you hear anything about this issue. Get the facts on what is happening in our country today. Much of the news today is pro-abortion propaganda. Be wise. Don't be deceived. And parents, teach your children about sexual purity so they don't even get into the position of having to make a difficult choice like this. Ask me or one of the pastors, Pastor Jim, Pastor Philip, to help if you don't know how to talk to your kids about these things. Second is be compassionate. We need to show compassion to the unwed mother, not condoning the sin, but caring for the sinner, leading them to repentance and restoration and loving on them. Christians should be just as concerned before the pregnancy and after the pregnancy as they are during the pregnancy. Our church has a long-standing relationship of support for the Local Choices Crisis Pregnancy Center, which helps young women to choose life. If you're not on their email list, almost every week their director sends us prayer requests of people that are really on the fence and that need prayer and success stories of people who choose life and give their children a godly life. And I want to add one important message at this point. If you've had an abortion or if you've supported a friend or a family member through an abortion, please understand that there is forgiveness. God is not going to condemn anyone, whether it's abortion or anything. I mean, I've done things in my life, and one of the most amazing things God does is he offers forgiveness and restoration. I can imagine myself going up to the pearly gates and I'm saying, well, why would you let me in? What about this I did? And what about God's going to say, I don't remember. Because what God forgives, God forgets. And that's beautiful. 
Many women share that their abortion was the greatest sorrow of their lives. One woman said, if I had only one thing to do over in my life, I would have that baby. If you're like that woman, please know that with God there is complete forgiveness and healing. The third is to be active. Get involved in the law-changing process. You know, I asked this question once to a group. I said, if you could change one law in this country, or if you could write one new law, what would it be? It really makes you think. Each one of you has the power to change the laws. The government works for us. They don't know that yet, <laughs> but they work for us. And we need to speak out. It's a shame how many Christians don't vote in elections, don't speak out for what they believe. And just speaking for myself, I've come to the place where I will only support those elected officials who agree that abortion is wrong and are committed to changing the laws based on that conviction. Isaiah the prophet said, don't be silent. Shout it aloud. Don't hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. We need to be that voice for those who have no voice. And then be prayerful. I know many of you know about being prayerful. Fall on your knees before the almighty God. Pray that he will change the direction of this nation that has launched out into a sea of innocent blood. This coming, not this Wednesday, but the next Wednesday, the first Wednesday of July, we're having our all-parish prayer meeting. A wonderful free dinner, and then we're going to pray from 7 to 8. And this July, the theme is to change the nation. It's the day before July 4th. What better thing to pray for than our nation? We once held to God give, our God-given right to life in this country. Well, those, those days are gone. The night has come. But you know what I can stand and say this morning is nothing is impossible with God. Amen? Amen. Nothing is impossible with God. Slavery has ended. Jewish Holocaust has ended. Pray that the American Holocaust might end as well. Pray that the killing of innocent unborn might end. Pray that by the grace of God and our repentance, the dark night of the soul of this nation might end and the light of the gospel might one day continue to shine brightly in this land. We were once known for being a God-fearing land. Now we're a God-canceling land. That has to change. I pray that God would remind us that one unplanned pregnancy saved us all on Calvary. Although Pastor Philip corrected me last night and he said it wasn't unplanned. God planned <laughs> Jesus to come down into Mary and all of that. But from Joseph's standpoint, I think it was very unplanned. <laughs> He was very shocked. I have in the Welcome Center um, a couple of sheets of little memes, which are little, you know, powerful truths. And, and there's many of them on there that are, are, are powerful, and they remind us of this, of this fight for, for life. And I encourage you to take them and read them, because oftentimes a meme is something that includes something that we need to hear, and we need to, to be shocked. Let's pray. Father God, we pray this morning for your mercy. Our nation, once great, really deserves to be destroyed because of abortion alone, even if we had no other sins. We pray for forgiveness and healing for those who have had abortions and for all those who have had a hand in them. We pray that you'd lead them to the cross and help them look up to him whose hands and feet were pierced, that their sins might be paid for and their forgiveness freely given. We thank you that when you call us to choose life, it's not only for unborn children, but it's also for our lives that need to be born again and to follow you into the way of life. Some of us can choose life today by choosing to trust you, Jesus, as Savior and follow you as Lord. And if your truth about life has caused us to feel deeply troubled, I hope that it troubles us into more prayer. I hope that it troubles us into taking action. Help us to want to take a stand with a church that preaches and practices the truth of Scripture, that wants to reach people for Jesus, that wants to stand up for these innocent babies who can't stand up for themselves. Let's all pray every day for our nation that's little, literally drowning in a sea of innocent blood. Pray that God would continue to show us mercy and that he would enable us to turn the tide against this great evil of our time. We pray this with great faith and confidence and in Jesus' name.